I'm Johnny Hamill, and welcome to Jammin' with Johnny and Casey Bass Stream. I have a unique way of life as a bass player and music educator. I felt like having a podcast long overdue. I'll talk shop with all my creative friends and shine light on things happening in KC. There we go. We're ready to go. Welcome to uh, Jamming with Johnny, Casey Bass Stream. We're here with one of my dear friends and colleagues, Dr. Hans Sturm. Um, if for those people out there that don't know as much about Hans as you should, uh, he is first off a lifetime faculty member. Uh, I say lifetime because the Casey base has been st- going for 12 years now, and uh, he's been uh, essential to all 12 years of it. And hopefully in this podcast, I kind of shine a little bit more light on on what we've been doing and why Hans is so uh, uh, essential to what I get to do in Kansas City. Uh, and... Uh, I say lifetime because there's no way he's ever getting out of not coming <laughs> to it. Uh, and we'll talk about that as we go. Uh, and then, of course, he's the current ISB president, which is very important for people to, to know the connection between the International Society of Basis and what I do uh, in Kansas City uh, and, and the other things that we do around the country as far as base uh and two-time president he's crazy enough to 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 say yes twice because he's essential i don't think that has there ever been a two-time president you're the first one right no i'm the first one yeah now now that 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 said though there i mean uh back in the day uh you know when barry green Mm -hmm. uh, you know he was he he was the the president, the organizer, I'm not sure what he called himself, but you know, right. he, he kind, kind of, of did it got for that. So, so for, he did it for a number of years and yeah. then uh, Jeff Braditich took it over for, um, for a number of years be- before, before a formal, for yeah, but before, a, 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 yeah, a formal board of directors and so on was formed and yeah. yeah. And then, uh, of course he's, uh, teaches at the university of, I mean, uh, Nebraska university in Lincoln, Omaha. I mean, Lincoln, Nebraska, <laughs> Sorry. it's early in the morning for me, folks. Uh, he's the jazz professor, study, or jazz studies professor, and uh, he's really uh, brought uh, an amazing light to that uh, university through, uh, he was originally at Ball State, and then he moved closer to Kansas City because he wanted to be closer to me and the Kansas City barbecue. Absolutely. <laughs> And uh, it's just been wonderful to have him closer. Uh, but he's just made that program just, you know, amazing. And uh, of course, this all is side effects that he's one of the great bass players. Uh, he's recording and perform, performing artist uh, resume is a little bit stunning to read. And you can read that on his websites and um, web pages. I was going to read more of those and I started reading and I was like, that might take the whole hour and a half just to get through all that. <laughs> but he's played with everyone and he's, uh, you know, world-class classical player, jazz player. His work in the avant-garde is definitely something I just want to say because I think sometimes uh, even myself, I, I, uh, when I first met Hans, I didn't realize how deep he went into the avant-garde jazz scene. Uh, and that's a very important genre, subgenre of music that needs to be uh, highlighted. Uh, it needs some love, Just like the bass. It needs some love. <laughs> it needs to shine. Bass love. That's right. Yes. Uh, okay, so that we're gonna kick it off here with a very special song that Hans, you composed this song, right? I mean, you sent it to me, and I think I got to hear uh, right when it was written. You you sent me a you you called me and put it on my voicemail, and uh, you were playing the piano, I believe, and singing it to me. So 
I yeah, I, 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 I wrote this actually about, about going to the, the whole idea is going, it, it's not uh, overt in the, in the lyrics, but the whole idea is uh, getting excited uh, to, to get in the car, to go back to Kansas City and uh, uh, to play bass, hang out with Johnny and eat barbecue, but it's called a, a, a Bel, Air, Bel Air barbecue. So it's about a classic uh, old car, and uh, going down and, and, and singing the um, uh, Jackie's, uh, singing the praises of the great uh, Kansas City barbecue. All right, let's, let's hear it. Beautiful, beautiful. Yes. So I. 
that that takes me right back. Yeah, that's here's that's, the, uh, oh, there we go. Here's the picture. I I mean, we have like twenty thousand pictures of us eating barbecue because uh, first I I mean we got to get to the real stuff here. We got to talk about eating barbecue in Kansas City because you know um, this is important because. I, I joke with Hans because they said sometimes you're like, oh, I've eaten at all the barbecue spots and then I rattle off 10 more and you're like, oh, I haven't done that one. Because my father's joke was you could throw a rock and you would hear it hit a great barbecue joint in Kansas City uh, because there's so many of them and they're all kind of unique and some of them do ribs better than the other stuff and some of them have a special sauce. That's just incredible. You know, like they each have their own flair. There's what I call the the working man's barbecue, which means it's still under $10 to eat there. <laughs> uh, well, currently maybe a little bit more, 12 bucks or something, but you know, you can eat for nothing. You know, it's cheaper than going to Arby's and better. And then of course you have the boutique, uh, ones and the historic ones like Brian's is the original to me and uh, and then they go off so that line in this st- where you start naming gates and and uh, uh, LC's. LC's and uh, yeah and, LC's and just at LC the guy LC just passed away and his, oh, da- I didn't know his, that. Oh. his daughter's running it and we're so excited that uh, it actually might even be better because I think she's more with it <laughs> like run, running the business anyway, I guess. Elsie's was like, I'm about cooking some good food. Um, yeah. And well, uh, you, can, you, you can, you the, the, the record that, that tune is on the uh, uh, Rose Finger Don record. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of, of Jackie's. And that was, I think a shout out to a couple of the players, the, the solos, of course, that's Jackie Allen who's singing my, my wife and uh, that trumpet player, uh, that's a Chicago horn section. Yeah, uh, that Victor Garcia on the uh, on the trumpet, and uh, I mean, it, he's just he, now people know about Marcus Hill be, uh, because he won the um, Thelonious Monk competition. Uh, but Victor, as far you know, is, is, is like one of those cats. As far as I'm concerned, is like right up there uh, with yeah. him. Andy Baker, who's the director of jazz studies at um, uh, University of uh, I want to say University of, of Illinois, Chicago. That might be wrong, but he's in Chicago anyway. And then uh, the guy playing a bass clarinet is also a terrific saxophone player, Jeff Bradfield, who plays with Bash. That's uh, Jeff Bradfield uh, with uh, Dana Hall is the drummer. And uh, it's, um, oh my goodness, the bass player. I'm spacing it now. That's embarrassing. Uh, uh, Sean... Um, he plays bass with with uh, with Kurt Helling. Anyway, that's a terrific trio. But that's a that's an amazing so that 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 beautiful color that bass clarinet. I love that. Yeah. Love that sound. Tom yeah. Larson playing playing organ. One of my colleagues at the university. That's great. Yeah. And t- who played the guitar on there too? Because I was. Oh yeah, John Mulder. Yeah, yeah, searing. What a what a what a great guitar player. And he's played with all kinds of of uh, uh, wonderful people. Paul Wertico, uh who was the, uh, uh, the the drummer with Pat Metheny uh, for, for years and years and years. And uh, John has a, uh, Mulder has a, has a trio with, uh, with Paul Wertico and Eric Hochberg uh, plays bass in that trio. That's, uh, yeah, he's been playing, we've been playing, making music with, uh, with, uh, with John for years since, I don't know, maybe 2000, uh, maybe earlier than that. Uh, and uh, and Dane Richardson, the percussionist, of course, who uh, it's been over 30 years we've been, we've been oh. playing with him. And he's amazing because he does. Uh, he studied in, in Ghana among the Iwi people and in Matanzas, Cuba uh, and in Bahia, Brazil. So he brings all those instruments, and, uh, all, yeah. all that all that rhythmic vocabulary to the table. Well, that's and, and then also you arrange that whole album for the horns is that correct or did you no the 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 horn the uh, i I wrote all of the all of the tunes on the record so these are all uh tunes that i wrote for jackie over over several year period Uh, so i wrote the lyrics and the music 
Um, that that horn arrangement was done by was done by Tom Larson. Oh, nice! So he was the one who who, who put that together. He's my colleague at the, the yeah. University of Nebraska Lincoln, and and, and uh, you guys you guys have the wonderful duo record with him, just, right? Uh, uh, a, a day in Paris. We yes. we went in. I went in to record uh, the, uh, uh, the the Rabat Concerto with Sylvain. Yeah, and uh, uh, the the one that he he performed. He, he wrote for the uh, Carnegie Hall. Yeah. And uh, uh, then we had we had a, a block out day that was in Studio DeVoe, uh, where Talking Head Talking yeah. Heads had uh, recorded and so on, and uh, Jimi Hendrix had recorded. Uh, unfortunately, that that uh, and that was an amazing room. By the way, it was I don't know how many square meters. It was an enormous room, parquet, beautiful French parquet floor, uh, Fazioli grand piano, the handmade Italian grand piano, same kind that Herbie Hancock would only play on. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so we recorded the concerto first, and then if we had any time left over, then then uh, uh, Tom and I had just been in uh, in Copenhagen playing for one of the bass festivals there, and so we recorded our our original duo material, and yeah. we put it all out a, a day in Paris. We had one day in the room. Studio de Vaux, unfortunately, doesn't exist anymore. They, oh. you know, with the with the advent of of uh, you know being able to. Um, uh, record uh, high quality stuff on computers and so on. there's less of a call for large recording studios the building got bought out and um, uh, yeah now it's, it's turned into condos so oh, that's, there you go <laughs> um, well uh, so that's the, the song is really dear to me, my heart because you know it, it was probably uh, the homage of blending this my favorite town which is important to me because for some reason when i was younger i always got called away to go to new york and go to uh frisco and la you know for because i obviously music calls and and sometimes people wanted to come there but for some reason i just love my town and i just would always come back to it and a lot of my fellow kansas city musicians they'll leave because they're all world-class players, but they just kind of come back here because, A, it's a great artistic town. You know, like it's it's really wonderful. It's also a nice, wonderful place to live. Um, and we also have a barbecue place on every corner. <laughs> well, and you, you got, you, and there, there are other great restaurants there too. I mean, you got great uh, yeah, you can get all kinds of food here, just so and, people and know. I love but, I gotta say is one of the best topless places in the country. It's yeah, incredible. There's, yeah. I mean, I, we're dealing with the kind of slowly poking our head out of COVID and realizing some of the restaurants that aren't going to be there anymore. And there's a couple of holes in my heart because, and, and, you know, like I'm one of those people that doesn't cook for myself. So I appreciate when people have a great restaurant. Uh, and but but the, 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 the other thing about, about, about Kansas City is the history, the history in jazz. Yeah. I mean, the history in jazz is, is so deep and so profound. And uh, of course, with, you know, Charlie Parker and, Count you know, and Count Basie, and you, you, you have that. The fiddler, that, don't forget the fiddler. Yeah, but it's, but it's remained a place where, uh, you know, you can still, I mean, this is, this is, Neil Tesser is one of the great jazz critics and, and, and writers. He wrote the Playboy, uh, the book, uh, The Guide to Jazz and so on. And he talks about like, uh, he talks about there are still certain communities that you can make a living as a jazz musician. Mm -hmm. and, and these are the places that, you know, we hold near and dear to our hearts. I mean, New York, of course, uh, has, has always been that Chicago has been one of those places continues to be. And despite this, you know, this changeover and what's happening in the music industry, Kansas city continues to be a place. There are places that support the music, support the musicians, the audience is there, supports the music, supports the musicians. And, and there's a, a really, really rich scene that, that runs the gamut of still the early, the early music, the KC sound, and, and all of that from, yeah, from the yeah. early period through Bop, right to the most, you know, uh, uh, cutting edge 
yeah. stuff that, you know, Matt Otto, who's been out there, you know, working with the Bob Shepard and, and, and those cats, Matt Villinger. I mean, there's, there's stuff happening right out at the, at, at the front edge. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a terrific music community. Yeah. Well, I know we have, uh, uh, to me, a, a number of young bass players that I just, I, I, I love to go listen to them play and, you know, I love to play jazz myself and I get out there and play. Um, I kind of like what I do myself, but I, you know, obviously I go and I dig all of my colleagues in the course. Oh, Joe, yeah. Joey, Joey Pinella and Jeff Harshbarger and Gerald yeah. Spates and oh. Bob Bowman, when he comes back in town, now he's, 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 he got married and moved out, but, but he, he comes back all the time. I mean, there's so many great, Ben, Ben Leifer and ben, Dominic, ben Leifer. Dominique Saunders, uh, just, I, I just, uh, and he's, he's bouncing back and forth between LA as a, as a, as a, as a major league, uh, uh producer yeah. and also a major league bass player. So he's just, yeah. Well, that's, superstar. that's what I love about all, all of those store, you know, all of the bass players, there's so many more. Uh, I, I would just keep rattling off names till we, you know, like, but <laughs> an easier way to do it is just go to the Kansas City Bass Workshop .com and look at all the faculty members. And, you know, I, I should probably put a label of who's actually Kansas City local on there because um, me and you did this thing 12 years ago that we decided to, and you were one of the most important people. Uh, you were second per important person. The first important person was George, who actually was like uh, looking at me and saying, why aren't you starting a workshop? And I was like, that seems like a lot of work for a bass player, you know, like, uh, oh, what is going on here? And uh, George just laid that gauntlet in front of me. Obviously, my, my uh, beautiful story of my last conversation with him was, he said, it looks like I won't be coming to that workshop you keep talking about. And uh, those were daggers in my heart because I was crying because I knew I wasn't going to talk to my friend anymore, uh, at least on this planet. Uh, and uh, I just hung up the phone and I pretty much called you pretty much once I could form sentences and said, hey, we're going to do this thing. And the best part about you was leading up to that, when I'd say something about doing something in Kansas City, you were like, just, you just say when and where and I'll be there. And for somebody of your, you know, stature and expertise to say that to me as just a bass player in the middle of Kansas, you know, oh, <laughs> you know yeah, like that, that meant the world to me. Johnny, you know, you know it was, it, it, I, I this is what we do for each other as, as bass exactly. players. You know, like I say all the time, like you say all the time, you know, we spend 99.9% .9 of our time supporting other musicians all the time. We're very supportive of each other. It's the history of the ISB. It's the history of everything. And, and you know, we had, we had had that, we had had an earlier conversation. You know, we, uh, we went out to dinner together. I, I'm pretty sure it was Chinese. I thought you know, we, went, we went to sushi. Did we go to sushi? And, yeah, because we, we had we had Desmond there, and it was the first time he had ever tried sushi. Remember? It was. I, I just remember it was in, we we were in D.C. Exactly, and uh, we were, we were there. And, and, yeah, and, and that was that that crew. You know, uh, uh, Lloyd Goldstein and yeah. you and uh, Frank Murray and uh, 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 Nick Walker, who was there. Tracy. As, as, Tracy. As Tracy, yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was that, that, that particular group of folks. I can't remember exactly who was there that, that yeah. year, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I was, I was so turned on and. It, and also, you know, you know, like it was definitely me, me, you and uh, my daughter and Desmond and Lloyd at that sushi meal anyway. So. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, the first one that I went to, the first Vance uh, uh, Institute that I went to, I, I, I went because I, I wanted to, to yeah. get with Francois. I wanted to 
to, to, to be close to him and his teaching. And uh, at that point, um, George, he, he, the, the, the books he, he had self-published, yeah. they were done in that plastic comb yeah. uh, binding and it was paper minute, with, the, with kind basement. of a, yeah, kind of a teal color, kind of a light yeah. blue color. Yeah. And uh, I, when I was teaching at Ball State early, early on, uh, there, there, I, I got there, and there, the, the base professor who preceded me had been there for, you know, thirty-five years, something like that, and he he retired and left. There was a one-year interim professor, and so the studio really took a took a dive. I think there were three majors when I got there, mm. and uh, so what had happened was uh, the percussion professor was really good friends with the bass professor, and uh, the, the 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 old guy who was who, who had retired. And uh, he was not recruiting anymore and so on. So, the, so in order to, for him to have a full load, the percussion professor required all of the percussion students to take bass lessons because he said they need to learn for the timpani, they need to learn bass clef and they need to learn to play, and I quote, a non-fixed pitch instrument. Oh, oh my goodness, right? So here I am trying to teach these percussionists how to play bass. And it was George's book that I was using. So I was teaching like 14 of these kids at, yeah. at, at, at a time. And so when I called George, I wanted to come as a student to learn from Francois. And uh, George said, I got your application. He called me back. He said, but I know you're teaching using my materials. You should come and do some, you should come and do some teaching too. But I'm like, but I want to experience it like a student. He says, he says, Hans, you must understand, everybody who comes here is a student of Francois. Right, yeah. We're, we're, we're all learning from Francois. That's the point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think oh, that's, I, I, I definitely, you know, that idea of what, you know, like I, I went to George's thing because I met him at the first ISB I went to, which was, of course, mind blowing. Uh, it was the one at Rice, uh, I believe. I, I always mess up the date, but it might be 97, 90, you know, like, and so then the next year I went to my first workshop uh, at George's because I actually met George as a friend at the ISB, like, and he, you know, introduced me to Francois and I didn't know he was such a, a great pedagogue and what he was doing, I didn't know. I just was hanging out with him at lunch going, yeah, what this base stuff is pretty cool. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and then I went out there and of course, the minute I went to George's workshop, I said, I'm going to go back to Kansas City. I changed my plans, uh, my career plans and decided just to teach little kids right then and there, the minute I saw it, especially when I talked to him about it, cause I, I went to George's workshop to learn to teach little kids. I, I thought Francois was really great, but I was always going there to figure out what George was doing. Because <laughs> how, how do you take something like Francois and show it to a little kid? Uh, to me, it was just, you know. And that was, I, I think, it, 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 in, France, in Francois' life and the, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The... The, I, I, you know, like you're the Johnny Appleseed of the bass, yeah. right? I can say that because it's Johnny, but it, it's like it comes from, it comes, it come, it's, it's the propagation. That's the word, the propagating Francois's technique. Yeah. And we had this, we had this issue because, you know, thinking about Francois's history and so on, you know, uh, Paul Ellison was the first one to kind of go over and study with him after he had come to yeah. the, to the, to the early ISB, I think it was in 78. Um, and uh, got turned on and Francois was developing the method and everything. And, and there were a lot of heavyweights who heard Francois play wanted to get some of what he had, some of the magic of his playing and his ability. And Barry Green was one of those players. But um, Francois, I think, began to understand that if he really was going to have people follow in his footsteps all the way from the beginning, mm -hmm. that he had to find uh, uh, not only to touch the young people, but to find people who could teach the young people. And that's what he found uh, with George. And, and, and George 
taking, making that marriage between his going and working with Suzuki mm -hmm. and understanding that, you know, uh, teachings through exactly what he calls his method, progressive repertoire, pieces that get incrementally more difficult, but you're playing pieces. You're, you're learning yeah, music yeah. by playing music. P that P element. Piece, pieces that sound good on the instrument and can be put on stage. And so that the, the student grows in that ability to shake it. Exactly. And they have a performance experience. And that marriage between that concept and that way of, of teaching and connecting to the students, that marriage of that with uh, Francois's very innovative way of approaching the instrument and uh, his, his, his pedagogy of the, the positions, especially for the left hand, because the the shifting, I mean, we're, we're all back, you know, with our arms back here like this, and this yeah. is where we all start, and and we have to be, it's like like going to the going to the circus or the fair, you have to be this high to ride this ride, and George was the one looking for smaller instruments, he got that, yeah. I think, and, right off the bat, so and, George. And qual yeah. quality easier to play smaller instruments, because I think there's instruments that were smaller maybe you know or you know like you go and play some of the smaller basses from pre-george era and it's just like oh that sounds terrible you know like the strings yeah. are flopping around they're trying to make it like a, a heavy orchestral bass and it's like they don't they don't need that to learn the bass they just eventually you know like to get the freedom of the muscle you know like the biggest thing about teaching is the muscle contraction that you have to learn to relax you know the big muscles the thumb muscles and you know you got to learn to stand behind the instrument more <laughs> and yeah and, 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 all, and, and this kind this kind of connection is as george was finding his way in this and you know getting turned on to suzuki when he moved back to dc and then yeah. uh, uh, having his young student playing with it and playing with a, a cello basically with with retune and then going and then uh, checking out uh, Rodney Slafford and the uh, and the bass yeah. project and getting get, getting turned on that, that whole conversation then beginning to move to where we now have as as what you do I mean what you do for Kansas City you know actively teaching kids as young as what three, three. three. four three yeah that's, that's I'll, I'll because, take them at two if I have a somebody brave enough to start <laughs> Whenever the, you know, because really the, the George's method, uh, he's, he trained me to start him at five. But when I asked him why he didn't start him at three, he said, I spent all my money making the bases small enough for a five-year-old. You know, like I, I, he, didn't, he didn't have a small enough quality of base at that size. So he just started him at five. Um, and so I went ahead and I, by that time, that was towards the end for George when he told me that. So I don't think he, he was like, I'll let you do that. <laughs> but the, 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 and the, the point of all of this is that three, this is when uh, the, the great, you know, you, if you want to play cello and, uh, to be the great soloist like Yo-Yo Ma, or you want to play violin to be the great soloist like Itzhak Prone, you're going to start at that age. You're, yeah. you're you're gonna you're gonna start at three you that, that's the age and if in our world in the base world when i was coming up i mean i, I was born in 1960 so it's easy to do the math um you, you know when, when i when i was coming up in, in in high school i started playing bass because i was tall enough when i was i mean i was playing the violin from a young age but but to to, to play the bass i had to be tall enough to handle a three quarters bass because that's what was available. The bases weren't even available at, at the, well, of course we didn't have in the elementary school. We had strings in the elementary school, but it was only for violin, viola, and cello. Yeah. Uh, we, we didn't, the bass didn't even exist for string we, players until high school. We, we had, we had uh, bass players in fourth grade in our, in my district or where, wow. where my public school but and i remember them coming into class in third grade to say hey string starts next year you want to sign up you know and and they would just every everybody stand up and they would grab the tallest boy and they're like you're the bass player you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah that was that was their their rational so did they did, did you did they have a 
fractional, did they have it like a half size or? Uh, yeah, definitely quarter size spaces in the district. By that, by that time. Yeah, because when I did my student teaching, you could go in there and they would have quarter size spaces. Yeah, see, I was, uh, I was in high school in the, in, 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 in the 70s. So, in, yeah. you know, 76, uh, 75, 76, 77, they, we didn't have, you know, it was, it was, it was what we call three quarter size base, but for anybody right. who's not a bass player, uh, three quarter size base for bass players is full size bass. That, yeah. That's, 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 just, we have what we call full size bases that are, but those are monster bases. Yeah, that you, for sure. Yeah. Uh, to, to well, play in I, I don't want to, I, I, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so I want to keep moving forward. So, uh, but that idea of George is, was really important to me because, you know, I'm one of those people that, you know, like, I don't want to teach a three-year-old just because they're going to be the next, you know, Francois Raboff, like that, George's message and, and me talking to Francois about all this is really important, you know, because Francois didn't just set out to be the world's groundbreaking bass player, you know, like he, he just did it because he was fascinated by it and he loved it. Um, and that idea is very important because the men and I met George, it was a different level of, of, re, you know, like he was on the same path as me teaching, which was that idea that I was like, when I taught my students, the parents would always ask me, how much should they practice every day? And I was like, I don't know, how much time do you tell you when you buy a, a video game, how many hours do you put in? Like, I don't clock that kind of stuff, <laughs> you know, like, I right. just, you know, like you should, you know, if you're having trouble practicing every day, yeah, sure set up a time that you start but don't look at the you know like don't just be like i gotta do 30 minutes like you'll never get anything done and you will never get to the point where you love it i mean maybe there are some styles of learning and some some students that that really helps i, I I'll, I'll backtrack on that but what we're really looking for to me is to instill the love of sharing music with other people, which in, and that was what George wanted. Like he wanted uh, young kids to just love music and love playing the bass because the bass is such a, a gorgeous thing to do. You know, like it's really a, a remarkable thing. It also comes with, one of the most amazing caveats of the instrument, which is it has a bass family that is just, I, I can't think of another instrument that's, that's more extraordinary than the, the bass community. And I, I know the, with ISB, it's, it's, it's shining light mainly on the upright bass and the same with uh, George was mainly doing upright bass stuff. But really, if you, me and you both know all of these wonderful electric bass players, and like it doesn't really matter if the guy's playing bluegrass or, or uh, country music or garage rock or you know jazz. Like if you if you look at somebody and say I play bass, you know you have a a conversation like this that goes on, and then you're like, oh, I could, I better go. You know, it's, it's nice to meet you. You know, like it's just an amazing, beautiful thing when I travel the world, it doesn't matter if I don't even speak the same language as that person. If I, if they're a bass player, like we're on this level, that's so wonderful. And uh, I, 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 I just would chime in here about that. I mean, I think that's, that's the other thing is that you will find in great symphony orchestras, you'll find great, j great jazz bass players as well. You know, that, that uh, going to the ISB, for instance, is really fun for me. I mean, I, I remember this early on, and I, I, I want to say it was maybe in 94, I, we went, Jackie and I went to uh, uh, play at the, at the Edinburgh Festival, the, the, the bass festival there, and then the Fringe Festival. And uh, Peter Kowald was there, who was... Uh, uh, was was a, a, a genius of the of the avant-garde yeah. and uh, uh, there were different events happening at the same time and I'm and I'm looking around and Peter Kowalt plays I can say sound sculptures 
Yeah. It's not in a particular rhythm, although he, that doesn't mean he doesn't play rhythmically. It's not necessarily in a particular key. It, it doesn't, you know what, it's, it's, it's music that, that transcends all of that. He, he speaks of himself as being like a Santa Claus with a sonic bag on his back. <laughs> and he reaches back and he pulls out this idea and, and creates it. So he's doing things. There was one thing he did that was just amazing. He detuned his E string and he pulled it away from the bass as he was bowing it. And it sounded like a lion roaring, but the lion was the size of a hippopotamus. Yeah. Or elk. And I look around, who's in the hall? Who's in the small hall? And it was Proto and David Walter. And I mean, these are like iconic classical. I mean, well, they, they're interesting. They, they have broad interests, but you know, there were there were symphonic players and jet. So it, it wasn't just the you know avant-garde heads that were there. It was yeah. everybody's interested in what's going on in our instrument, checking checking out all kinds of things stylistically. Well, I mean, it, it's sharing of art, and and that's really important. exactly yeah and, yeah. And, and it's you know, as Francois always says, you know, you just you they find them their own sound. And, you know, like, as you study with Francois, he, he'll, sometimes if you start sounding like too much like this person or that person, no, don't do that. <laughs> Be yourself, you know? And, uh, and, and even like, he doesn't want, when I first bought my library, he looked right me in the eye and it was like, you want to sound just like me or something. And I said, no, you know, like, I, I, that was definitely not my intention. I, I needed the technique to get to a, a better place for myself. And uh, uh, yeah, I, that, 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 that whole concept of every, everyone is unique. Yeah, we need every voice. Yeah, yeah. Because that's, that's the real great thing about what, uh, I'm going to bring this back to Kansas City because this is important for, for people to, to know how much you've helped guide me in this, this, thing because because i'm not i didn't start the kansas city bass workshop to to just make my bass studio like the greatest thing ever and all which my, which it is thank <laughs> you but you know like uh you know i i i don't have a a policy in my studio and george didn't either you know like i'll take anyone that's interested in coming and studying the bass and learning to love it and uh, and so this I George was pushing me to do the workshop for this reason, and I, of course I don't know. I'm I, I'm telling you what I think George was doing, uh, and maybe you too. But I don't know. You guys probably had a conspiracy behind my back and talking about getting this going. <laughs> but uh, but you know, like this idea of building a community, and that's important because the bass players are a unique instrument. We do have this bass family, but if we think about like art saving the world in, of its troubles, let's just put it that way. I don't think it's gonna save the world physically, but you know, like art has a way of unlocking doors that, you know, from, you know, hopefully ending uh, wars uh, or at least healing damages of wars and damages of, of arguments and dangers of broken hearts and whatever else art does to save us. And we all know that it does save us in some form. There's not a person walking this planet, maybe just a small person, but they're, they're going to eventually have art save them in some way. Uh, and uh, that idea of bass players, if we think about bass players, like there's no music out there that doesn't have a bass line except for Buddhist chant. And, you know, like, <laughs> I, I mean, and I'd probably put a bass line to that or I hear a bass line under it and it'd be, it'd be really rad. Uh, but, you know, like, like bass players are, are unique because, yeah, it's not like the, it's the people who are drawn to the bass are unique people. I find that they, they are very, really, like to be a great bass player, you just have to learn to listen, right? 
you know, like you have to listen to everybody. Like nothing's better than being in an orchestra and sitting there playing. Of course, sometimes our our bass parts are so easy, you know, we're oh, doing whole notes forever. But we can so we have time to just listen to the everyone in the orchestra play. Like that's my favorite thing to do in the orchestra is play and just listen to everyone play. You can hear all 80 people play like individually, right. collectively, you know, and that idea of, you know, bass players uh, learning to listen. So you start them at three and they go off to college, probably going to play the bass the rest of their life. Some of my students, very talented, don't go off to play the bass forever or they go away from it because, you know, they become a mother, they become a, a father, they become, uh, you know, they get some other uh, occupation, uh, you know, doctor, lawyer, scientist, you know, like I have a lot of that stuff happen uh, to some of my students, but they still have this ability to listen and understand the connection between every interaction that they have with every other person, you know what I mean? And to learn to listen to things. Uh, the fact of it is, is that, you know, like it is hard if you're a classical player and then you go hang out with rock musicians who don't read music and they're probably just playing something over and over and over and over again is maybe how you would hear it. Or you go to jazz musicians, everything's improvised. You don't know those songs, just start playing, you know, uh, that could be overwhelming. Or you go play with, um, you know, Middle Eastern people and they're all in odd time signatures. And that's, it's not easy to do that for the first time, you know, even as a great perform, you know, like these great um, musicians, but they bass players have a tendency to learn to listen enough to where they can adjust. You know, I know that's part of my greatest part about playing the bass is that I'll, you know, I still, if, if somebody comes to me and like, uh, we want you to play this, this music. One time I, I got asked to play klezmer and I never heard of the word klezmer before. I never heard the music and, and they were like, we're going to go to Japan. I said, yes. I'll go. <laughs> and so they came over and they started playing and I was like, oh, it sounds like this. You know, I did my best. And they were just amazed that I could both read some scores and also improvise bass lines. I didn't have to stop and write things down or anything. I could just, you know, most of it was pretty simple as far as chord progressions go. There was a couple of things I was like, I don't know what happened there. So, um, but we, we had that ability to, to again, communicate without even really knowing that language, so to speak, because it's- well, you, and, you, and, and Johnny, you, you, you foster this in your teaching. Exactly. Because well, you, that's... You, 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 that's, that's the other piece of it with, 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 with George and encouraging you to do the, the jamming with Johnny, you, your, your duets as, as part yes. of it. Everybody plays a duet with you in the, in, the, in, in the classes. Everybody improvises, everybody, they might not do that, might not be their thing, yeah, but you you invite them to 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 have this experience, so they their their vision of music immediately starts moving, becomes more broad. Yes, uh, well, I know that's another a, a whole nother subject for me and George was he looked at me and said you should write the book to teach improvisation, and you were standing there and Rufus Reed was standing. It, it was definitely, and I was like. <laughs> Uh, you can go ask those guys to write it. I'm not, you know, especially at the time, you know, I, I knew jazz, but I, you know, like you guys are jazz jazzers and that. And when you think of the word improvisation, I think of the word, I think of jazz because that's where I heard that first heard that term. But, um, you know, like the, the idea of jamming was much easier because I'm just making stuff up. Um, Sorry, I, got, I haven't had that happen yet. Um, are we losing you? Hello? Um, it, oh, there you go. You're breaking up a little bit. Honey. 
yeah, you're you're breaking up a lot. So we'll have to edit that out, buddy. Mm. Okay. okay, it's uh, the the record button is still going, uh, but you have frozen for me. Okay, yeah. Can should, you hear me? Should now? we try? Uh, it's better. I I can. Yeah. Are yeah. you can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, I I haven't had that happen yet, but uh, the just the 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 woes of 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 technology. Um, especially when I had just a really good thing to say. I hope it came out there, or I hope you heard it. Um, but that idea of George pushing the workshop, what? so now we're sitting 12 years after this workshop has been going, and I couldn't, you know, it's just like one of the great things about a teacher, you're trying to lay the foundation so that the next generation doesn't have to um, you know, has a greater avenue to do more things, you know? And so now, like, I feel so proud of the, the Casey Base Workshop because I did do some things that's slightly different than George. Obviously, uh, most of the faculty that are in Kansas City are just a direct lineage from George. And as Lloyd said, I brought, I kept George Vance's ideas alive I'm very proud to say, you know, thanks for that compliment. I'm just going to keep doing whatever I'm doing, but you know, like he's truly my, my hero, you know, with Francois being right next to him, like they're, 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 uh, two, two, two deities for me. <laughs> um, but, uh, that idea that when I think about 12 years of what really happened, which was, it becomes bigger than you. And I said that about the little barbecue picture. I posted it up one day and I was like, it's bigger than you. And of course I was talking about the size of the, of the plate there, but also what we've done, which is it, it's bigger than, you know, like we, I know that I, I dream one day that there's not just one Johnny Hamill in every city teaching, you know, 40 to 50 little bass players uh it's a it's a very great occupation and then they have a workshop in every town and they have what arose from the workshop was this amazing little Kansas City bass fest which is important that you know yes it's building 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 but I mean I, I can't I mean we almost have a miniature ISB at Kansas City every year when it happens because it's like every night i mean it's literally six nights because we have so many people that are coming to play the bass that are professionals that it's not just the first year was literally first night i played for about 45 minutes and then we went and had dinner uh i think there was you know 12 people in the audience or maybe five i don't know <laughs> it was pretty small and then you know like we had each one of us play and that was it. And there was the faculty recital, which is pretty common for a base workshop. But really, uh, now I have people that don't play the bass. And one of the reasons why I want to do the KC bass stream was we really have a, a, a small a small listening audience that are just coming to hear what the bass can do in all of these contexts. So we have, of course, it's easier for me to have a jazz night and it's easier for me to have a classical night and it's easier for me to have a rock night. Uh, but, you know, like they get pretty mixed up in there because sometimes it's like, where do you put uh, different people? So uh, it's just such a, a wonderful thing. And then, of course, at the end of the week, we all play together in a in a in a very important concert, which you know, I've been thinking about this for the last 12 years, how much that's grown and how much has taught me about how much we're doing as far as building the community that the community, it's just these parents that will tell people that their kids playing, but it's more than that. They're like, you need to come hear this concert at the end of the, the week because it's like they do everything. And it's the most extraordinary sound is 80 bass players all playing together you know like it's not it's not just a 
pat on our back for the end of the week. It's, it's an incredible performance. And sometimes I, I do say that about, I, 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 it's my favorite performance of, of the week because it's about all of us. And then we, we do that for a week and then they go out for a year, uh, you know, and start doing all these wonderful things throughout the year, right? You know, like uh, doing more and more things. So now it's kind of grown. Um, you know, we have uh, the Basemus concert has grown tremendously. I think you've been coming down for four years or something now. Obviously, we didn't have it last year for COVID, but like it's a citywide. We all get together and play Christmas songs like it and it's doing the same thing it's it's spinning that more and more people just want to come here this concert uh to call it tradition but you know like it, it's really really wonderful because you know this community building once once the the workshop's very important because if we're all playing together one of the things that i find as somebody who teaches little kids is it also dismantles the the ivory tower the negative thoughts that happen even amongst other musicians you know so sometimes you get that they get envious of other people so if somebody gets up and they're a little bit more popular or doing well uh you know they sell more tickets or sell more all of a sudden oh i don't like that per you know they they can they can start doing that kind of uh, stuff that happens but uh, at the workshop you're sitting there playing with a three-year-old kid you know like it kind of dismantles some people's uh, you know and so it I think it to me I think it allows people to learn more does that make sense like mm -hmm. it, it, it 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 shuts down those defensive mechanisms that we have as our, our, our inner ego, you know, like the ego's there for good reason, you know, like it, it, some of those reactions are natural human reactions, you know, like I just, but uh, it, it shuts down that thing and it allows for growth, personal growth. And I, I can't say this enough that like, I really feel that that's what George was going for the most because out of anyone, I mean, Francois is extraordinary at not having that. Like he's always been very open person. Like he didn't, I don't, I, I mean, I, I imagine at some point in his life, he's been jealous that some other person did something and you know, we, we, we're humans. I've been that way. You've been that way. You know, like it's natural human thing, but, but the fact of it is, is that do you act upon it and do you, do you harm the other person from that mechanism? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, but I, th I think in the in the in, in the base world, by and large, we don't see so much of it. And I think because we're supporting other people, that's part of it. I mean, yeah. I, I I know that there is performance anxiety uh, can come up yeah. for a lot of folks, and that's because uh, you want to do well, you want to impress, you want to have this. And, and that's, that's also a kind of a, a kind of a mind shift. But I think part of this, uh, one of the aspects of the, of the Kansas city based workshop is ensuring that everybody plays there. There right. is that, that, that noontime performance or afternoon time performance where the youngest kids play every, everybody plays. And you get into a situation like the, like the base day at, at, at UNL where, yeah. you know, I'll have a, 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 you're there since I've been doing it, you know, 11 years now, uh, we'll have a room full of, of, of students and, uh, you know, little, little Patrick Marks will be the first one to, you know, yep. to raise his hand. Now he's over in England studying with, uh, with Carolyn Emery uh, and, uh, and playing unbelievably well. Yeah, but we you know, can't yeah, little little guy coming up there. Well, you know, he's he's already setting the bar because his 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 attitude is so positive. He wants to get up. It's not a it's not a thing. And I, I remember this. Uh, it was uh, when I when I was president of the ISB the first time around. There were certain people that I wanted to make sure got invited, and uh, one of them was was Pablo Aslan, who's a, a 
what he's, he's, he's a great jazz player. He's a great classical player. What he's most known for is tango chops. Yeah, he's yeah. just an amazing tango musician. And I, I asked him, would he please come and give a presentation on, on the tango? Because I wanted to know more about the bow strokes and so on. Yeah. So he gets up there. The first thing he says is, man, he says, I'm, I'm so nervous. He said, I, I, I just I just got so nervous and I, I got to be said, but, you know, I'm I'm looking around and it's like, uh, over here is Ron Carter doing his thing, and over here is Renaud Garcia Fons doing his thing, and over here, and I'm like, everybody's doing their thing, and and well, this is what I do, so it's just yeah. that concept of of sharing, and then he hit his stride, and it was like, here's a stroke that we use in tango that your teacher told you never to do, you know, <laughs> uh, put the bow at a severe angle like this, grind your wrist in, and rip the string, right? Like uh. you're never supposed to do this except in tango, you know? So it was a, just a, a, a beautiful a, a beautiful sharing moment, that idea and this idea of community building. I love, mm-hmm. uh, I, I love so much. This is what my, you know, what my, what my father was like, we talk about fathers, but you know, this yeah. whole idea about building a community, building a sense of love and respect for the music and for each other. And the music helps us to do all of that because the music is always going to kick our butts. The music is always bigger than any one of us. And as the support, the foundation of everything that we're doing, of, of all the music that's getting played, we're kind of holding everyone up, kind of like, yeah. you know, Atlas in the world or whatever you want to say. You know, we're we're supporting well, all of that. You said that about fatherhood, and I definitely wanted to touch on that thing for, for us because, A, um, I've, I'm on now round two of fatherhood this year. <laughs> uh, and of course, you, you have uh, your wonderful father to uh, Wolfgang, who is uh, now almost going to be a senior this year. So a uh, different level of fatherhood once they uh, fly, the, fly, the, fly the coop, uh, go away um, and uh, become you know, their own uh, person uh like that and uh but uh we both also had two extraordinary fathers in our life and actually i would say parents because you know like mom and dad are the same to me but my dad and your dad were very uh, integral to our idea of sharing community like it comes natural to both me and you and one of the things I wanted to say about why, you know, you're so essential to Kansas City based thing is that you always pointed out this idea of sharing that it, it you know, like it was, it was, it was, um, it was very important on, on a bigger scope of like my, my city, like what the workshop's doing to help being the art in my city is extraordinary you know like i'm looking at the results of 12 years of work and i could see it you know uh, but also you know helping kids grow up and helping kids get through the college years uh we had two fathers that just were really great at, at doing that stuff Are you losing me still? I think you are. Um, yeah. I, 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 it, it, it froze just a moment, but you, yeah. Okay, okay. so, so uh, uh, you, know, like, you know, like, and, and then, of course, I, I, I you know, George, George was my mentor, my mentor uh, uh, but, but Francois, Francois who is, you know, you know, actually, actually even, older even older than my father, father uh, uh, both, 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 of, both our fathers, of our fathers just, just recent, recently passed away, passed away in the last five, minus five, five, five years, years, I think, going, going on six, six and now and years is something, something. So, we, so we both went through, through that, that, you know, you know that, that that loss of that, that person that's always, always, always been on, been on the phone, phone to help you. Uh, so, uh, so I like, I like to say Francois uh, uh, is almost, is almost like, like my honorary, honorary 
Papa, Papa, because, uh, uh, you, know, you know, like I can call him on the phone, phone to talk to him about more of the age base, and, and uh, he treats, he treats me like, like family, family when I, any, any time, and, uh, and uh, that, that father, fatherhood thing, thing is, you, you, you performed, performed um, um, a piece, a piece for, your for your father, father. really, really important, important to me, it was just, just so, just so wonderful. Um, um, I even, I even took off, took off work and drove up to Lincoln just here and here because it was so, was so important, important to me. You know, you know that. That's so, so um, um, thank you, thank you for that. Piece. I know, I know that you were just uh, um, doing, doing it to, to help to heal yourself, yourself or get through, get that, through that, that process, that process as, well. as well. But you know, you know it's important for all, for all of us to to see that see idea that idea of of. of, of uh, uh, and I, 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 like, I like, like to say parent, parenthood because, because again, again, we're, we're talking about our fathers because that's recent, recent in us, in us, and like I said, like I said to have that um, um, in there, in but, there. But you know, from my from my from my, from grandfather, my grandfather and my grandmother, both on both on both sides, and my and then uh, my mother, mother, and, and I'm sure, I'm sure the same, same mother, the mother, they they help they shape us in a way. way. To help, to help us build, build, build the community, and, and you know, you know, it just it comes, out comes out of us like that. Like that. Uh, uh, and you know, you know, it's it's easy, easy for both, for both of us to be that kind of father because, because uh, uh, you know, you know, it just, just, just kind of comes out of us because the way the way we were raised. So, so yeah, yeah. yeah. That's kind of nice. <laughs> Johnny, I, I, I agree with everything you said. I was able to hear you quite clearly, but I am getting some distortion now. Am I coming distorted on your end? Uh, no, I know you're clear of bell. So, uh, okay, uh, something's, something's I, I, happened to the sound. Let me just check if I have another. If I do that, no, that's not helping. And I'm going to keep talking, talking because I know on the podcast, podcast they, they probably, won't, probably won't hear, hear any of that stuff. I have, I have a couple, a couple of things going in my favor there. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I will uh, I, I will share just a, a, a brief story. My, my folks died within about eight weeks of each other. And uh, uh, in, in between the time that my father died before my mother died, um, I was asked to play a, a concert with Daryl White. Daryl's a great trumpet player, and we occasionally play in Kansas City at the Blue Room. Uh, we'll be coming back uh, your way in in September uh, to play with Jack with Jackie singing. I'll I'll I, I don't remember the date off the top of my head, but I'll get it to you. Um, but anyway, we 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 had played in Kansas City, and then uh, we were we were playing at the Sheldon Art Museum in Lincoln, which was a um, a museum that was designed by Philip Johnson, the same guy who designed the Lincoln Memorial in D.C., a beautiful building. And we were told to play anything. Uh, Daryl got the call, and so it was the same musicians who came up. Michael Warren was playing drums, uh, Jeff Jenkins, is a wonderful band. We got there, and it was uh, one of the assistant directors of the museum. Her father had died. He was on the, uh, on the faculty of the law school at UNL. And he was one of these guys that always showed up to jazz gigs. And he was always wearing, he, he, he rocked the mustache. He had always wearing a double-breasted suit, always wearing the bow tie. And uh, we thought we were just playing a concert. We didn't know that this was his memorial. And so his daughter got up and announced to the, to the audience that um, she wanted, uh, he, that, that she wanted everybody to understand that when he died, he was very specific. There wasn't to be much talking. Uh, she, they wanted a jazz group to play and to play whatever they wanted to play. And then after it was over, that we would then go into the, uh, into the main hall and um, we would drink uh, gin martinis uh, with uh, two olives and uh, a, a lemon twist because this was his, this was his thing. Now they didn't allow drinking in the hall but this was his favorite thing that was his drink and, and we got done with the concert and all of a sudden it had occurred to me this was his jam this was his thing this is what yeah. he wanted to share for his community this yeah. was yeah. his way of how he wanted to be remembered we're going to listen to some great music we're going to let 
the, the band play, and then we're going to have cocktails. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's the healing. The healing on and that was, and that, and that was it. And I, you know, my my father taught at Bucknell University for many years, and he was uh, on the on the uh, the faculty of the religion department, the philosophy department, uh, the political science department, and he was acting chair of geography because the only thing the geography department could agree upon was Doug Stern would be fair to everybody. Right. <laughs> so he had that kind of sense and the kind of, yeah. you know, sense, sense and respect of, of all of that. So that was, you know, his whole thing was he had a lot. He taught religion. Uh, I can say that I, I don't consider him to be an overly religious person, but his whole thing, if we were going to take a line out of the, out of the Bible, for instance, although he taught about many religions, uh, it was the line, if two or three are gathered in my name, you know, if two, and it's that whole experience of coming together as a community. And that's what we do. I mean, this whole thing about building, we're, we all have parents, we're going to die too. And so what is our legacy? What do we leave behind? If we can build a community, help each other, help one another. This is the most beautiful thing. This is, this is, this is, I think the purpose. We get the most satisfaction of doing things for other people. It's the, yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. deepest way to live. So that's the end of the of the interview. We did have some uh, internet connection problems there, as Hans was in France at the time. Um, so we'll end it there. We are almost done. We have uh, the final selection to listen to is Jackie Allen and Hans Sturm from their Nebraska Project CD um, out now. Uh, called Tail Tale, and it's a really uh, witty and fun song that a lot of the kids like to hear them perform at KC Bass Workshop. Hope you enjoy.
Hope you enjoyed the episode of Jamming with John and Casey Bass Stream. Please don't forget to check out johnnyhamill.com and caseybassworkshop.com to keep updated on what's new. I would also like to remind you that I'm an independent artist and music educator. I'll continue to shine the light on bass players and work to build cool creative community that does independent art. That includes my own. I deeply appreciate your support of the artists that are interviewed and to support the things that I do. On both websites, there are donation buttons, marketplaces, merchandise, and like buttons. Every little bit helps.